Um, thank you very much, uh, Don. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here today to talk to you about uh, the Roman Navy and how it, in my opinion, and certainly several other uh, scholars, uh, um, gained uh, naval uh, ascendancy after the First Punic War. Uh, I have firstly an omission to make and an apology. Um, I am a military um, um, stu uh, military history student. I'm not a, uh, a student of the, the uh, Latin. So uh, if I uh, provide uh, some amusement to some of you in my uh, speaking of some of the Latin terms, etc., uh, please take that on board. Um, my second um, uh, comment I would like to make is that I'm an infantry officer some 32 years, and so you may well ask, why am I talking about the Navy? Um, it's a reasonable question. Uh, having said that, I spent uh, my last two postings at the Army Command and Staff College in Western Creek in Canberra, which is in fact a tri-service organisation um, in Navy, Air Force and um, uh, Army. Uh, luckily, the Romans didn't invent the Air Force. That was to come some years later. Um, so, and during that time, uh, I, got, I was very interested in campaign planning, uh, did some instruction and some assessment on operational and campaign planning in what we call the littoral environment um, between the, you know, where the sea meets the, the land and, and how you secure lines of communications. Uh, getting ashore in, for example, in Normandy and in, in some of the land battles uh, requires a lot of support and coordination from the Navy and that's where a lot of my interests uh, came from and of course that culminated when I came back to w w UWA and studied the Roman Army and I found there wasn't much information about the Roman Navy uh, and most people talk about the legions and the, the battles that they fought and so I was naturally drawn to some of the, um, the issues about how they secured um, their lines of communication, supplied the troops and transported them and in fact gained naval supremacy uh, which um, I, I think they uh, uh, did quite successfully to become uh, the first superpower of the ancient world. Um, I've got two, two presentations, one an introduction um, of the Roman Navy and then my second part after, after uh, some sustenance and uh, afternoon tea uh, we'll look at the three battles uh, of the First Punic War which uh, resulted in Rome gaining naval ascendancy. Um, I am happy to take questions both uh, after each of the lecture presentations but also um, uh, during afternoon tea I should say. The um, scope of the presentation is so I'll run through some Ro uh, Roman warships, uh, some of the weapons and tactics, the crew, a little bit on their organisation, and we'll touch briefly on the archaeological record, um, mainly so that those that have an interest and wish to, uh, uh, you know, develop you know, study a little bit further can do so. Also, there will be some places where you can visit when you're doing your European trips. Um, you know, there'll be a few places that you can pop in and look for those uh, those links to the, the Roman Navy because there's a reasonable amount of uh, you know, source information out there. And I'll be happy to take questions at the end. Um, Roman, typical Roman warship that you will see in man, many of the... Um, uh, literature and certainly films. Uh, this in fact comes from uh, one of the uh, suppliers of uh, a number of model ships which are available, uh, which we have a couple here today uh, to show you. I'll, um, so please take the opportunity again uh, during um, afternoon tea or the break to, to uh, come down and have a look at them. Um, try and avoid picking them up too much because um, I've broken a couple of the 120 odd oars and, and my fingers are fairly nimble so um, but you know please uh, feel free to have a look. Navy warships, a couple of comments. Uh, they haven't changed in some 400 years. Uh, they were made out of um, uh, obviously uh, the lighter woods. Um, they were used a uh, technique called a mortise um, uh, technique where the planks were rather than linked over were in fact aligned dead on top of one another and they had a, uh, a mortise uh, cut into it where a piece of wood was fitted between the two planks and then a, they, the, uh, it was drilled and a wooden dowel was placed between the two which then linked uh, the, uh, the planks and held them in together. So a lot of skill involved in use, shaping these planks so that they fitted fair, you know, reasonably perfectly together in the shape of, of um, uh, the designated ship. 
Um, they were generally built on an 8 to 1 ratio, that's the, the breadth to the length, uh, some were shorter, etc. Um, and the maximum effective um, ratio was about 10 to 1 for a long and thin ship. And that was to facilitate the speed. Obviously, like arrows, the, the thinner the, the width or the breadth of the ship, uh, and in naval terms it's called the beam, uh, compared to the length, would allow it to cut through the water, reducing um, uh, the resistance of the water itself. They were made out of light timber. Uh, it was fairly common in the, the region, the pine, elm and spruce. And they were shaped so that they were they were fairly shallow in their draft, so the depth of the, the hull was fairly shallow, uh, unlike a lot of um, you know, later ships um, and more, uh, more current contemporary shipping. The main problem with that was that they did have poor sea keeping uh, qualities because the round uh, the hull, um, it was advantageous for going onto shores and, and beaching, which I will explain fairly shortly, was a daily necessity, but also um, um, during uh, it would, what they would, would naval people would call roll. The ships would tend to roll in seas and make them relatively unstable. Uh, that was to have you know, significant Im impact uh, on some of the longer sea voyages uh, later, um, as, we will, will, as, as we will see. They generally had a large, as in the model in front of you, a single large sail and a smaller one on the, um, on the, on the forward uh, the uh, forward edge of the uh, the ship. The main sail was um, simply rigged. It just would be rigged uh, to either go up and down, and was secured um, on, uh, by the by the crew of the ship. Uh, and obviously, in favourable winds, um, it would then uh, propel the ship um, at uh, somewhere between two and a half to four knots, which isn't very fast, but it was a lot better than rowing. In an unfavourable wind. Uh, you would only do um, one to one and a half knots, which isn't faster than walking, although most of us can't walk on water, so it was better <laughs> than rowing. Um, and we'll talk about rowing, generally somewhere between about four and six knots was what they could achieve um, on a leisurely cruise in the Mediterranean. Um, not so much in battle, of course. Um, oils were the primary uh, means of propulsion. Um, they had multiple banks, um, and you'll see them from single rows, a uh, single bank, through to three. Uh, and in some of the early uh, um, uh, texts, you'll find them talking about sixes and sevens and even the tens. Excuse me a minute. And I'll, brief, I'll explain um, in a few more slides what that nomenclature of four, five, sixes, and tens meant. Um, some of the early um, scholars interpreted that to be ten banks of rows of oars or dipping, and if you can visualise, these are simply three rows. Imagine ten rows of oars vertically on a, a ship. For starters, the ship would have to be enormously high and would almost certainly roll over, um, but the practical limitations of rowing, if any of you have ever rowed a, a skull, an eight or, um, uh, for your local school or something like that, or even seen the head of the river, you'll understand how much coordination, not to mention some of the physics of how long the oars would have to be if you were in a you know, six high or ten high um, uh, ship. So I'll explain what the fours and fives were meant for, so that if you do some reading you'll find that um, you, you, that'll be a little bit clearer. The speed, uh, most of these boats would do four or five knots, which is a comfortable cruising speed, and certainly the ones with multiple um, oarsmen would rest uh, alternating their crewmen. Um, and if you've had a look, uh, or been familiar with the Mediterranean map, which most of you I'm sure are, uh, you'll see that some of those distances from Alexandria to Rome uh, would take a number of days uh, at four or five knots, which is um, a, a nautical mile is uh, about 2,000 metres or so. So you'd be looking at um, quite a, um, a long journey, um, you know, just doing it by oar. So you'd, you'd need to develop a fairly good rowing speed uh, to achieve four or five knots per, uh, per hour. And we'll talk about what they did um, by day and night. Uh, battle speed was uh, seven to nine knots. In some cases, it's been, uh, ten, to, 10 knots have been achieved. Uh, but a, the Olympus, which I'll show you later, 
which was a modern reconstruction with physically fit uh, uh, uni students um, and some uh, uh, some military people. Uh, uh, in 1982, I think it was um, uh, a prime was made, and they achieved um, nine knots. Um, in fairly pleasant weather. So um, it was seven to nine knots um, would be achieved in, uh, you know, um, in, in when it came to a, a battle. Uh, the ships were generally <coughs> um, be beached at night. Um, that was because um, uh, being off firm pine rather than oak and some of the heavier woods, they tended to absorb water quite quickly. And then once they um, uh, absorb water, they become heavier and sluggish in the water uh, and so that would reduce the speed and make it harder work for the rowers and as a consequence they would rather try and beach them, uh, pull them up on, um, you know, in uh, ports so that they could then dry out overnight so they didn't accumulate extra heavy, heavy weight. Um, which is why when you look at the Mediterranean, there's a lot of little coastal ports, um, even from antiquity, days of antiquity, um, oft, you'll find major ports are often a day's uh, sailing, uh, or rowing I should say, from uh, the major ports um, where they would then uh, rest overnight, the crews could recover, and then they start the journey next, uh, the next day. Uh, the slip to dry out over the winter months, uh, sailing was a fair weather um, um, activity. Um, Neptune and the other gods and the weather gods would intervene very quickly and these ships were not uh, particularly seaworthy. Um, so he, there were more ships lost due to storms and interventions by uh, the, those sea gods than there were ever from uh, uh, actual naval combat. Uh, coastal engagements were very common and coastal engagements by day. Very little night uh, engagement was made. Firstly, most of the ships were uh, pulled to shore and secondly, um, um, you know, the sea at night, they didn't have the lighthouses or the lights or, or the technology to avoid, no GPSs, etc. Um, to avoid, um, you know, the rocks and the reefs and etc. at night. So uh, coastal engagements by day was generally the norm and most of the ancient naval battles were in fact by day. Give you some idea about uh, ship sizes. Uh, the smaller of the warships were the Liburnas, somewhere between 10 and 15 tonnes. Their length was about 20 to 25 metres. The speed, and as you'll find, most of the speeds were seven to nine uh, 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 knots. Had a roughly about 50 rowers sometimes marines, and their general tasks were uh, reconnaissance, transport, light attack, which means um, attacking individual um, transports that they found or uh, other smaller uh, light ships, um, and fleet communications, uh, not by radio or telegraph or flag, but generally by um, moving to a flagship, gaining a, getting a, uh, an officer and then moving them off to um, um, uh, the next uh, squadron commander, etc. So they would move people around, uh, etc. One of the other final things is they're often after a naval battle or even during a battle, rescue, where they would go and uh, try and rescue uh, uh, their sailors and their uh, commanders. Triremes, uh, which are the most common uh, ship for most people, uh, Generally, trireme means that it's got three banks of rows, operated by a single uh, oarsman. Weight was up to 45 tonnes, 40 uh, metres in length, and again, a speed of nine to 10 knots with a well-trained crew. Uh, they could m manage to do that for up to 20 minutes or so. Um, 176 rowers, and often a uh, crew, uh, marines of about 30-odd um, uh, um, marines. And their, their primary aim was to defend the ship and also at the same time, uh, whether they were able to, go and attack our, uh, and capture other ships. The tasks were generally escort and again light attack. The quadrivirings, um, they were starting to get fairly big ships. 110 tonnes, um, length uh, about 45 metres, speed 70, 7 to 8 knots and 360-odd rowers, so 180 rowers um, either side. If you look around now, you've got probably 100-plus people here. Almost double this number of people in the side of one of these ships, all crammed fairly close as you are in your sitting positions. Um, my, most of you have not 
um, uh, taken off your shirts and worked hard for the last uh, six hours rowing a ship, etc. So you can imagine what that would be if I asked you all now to turn around and practice rowing for uh, 30 or 50 minutes and then increase the tempo, you'd find very quickly that it would become a fairly, um, you would become fairly intimate with everyone within, within, the, sh uh, within the ship's environment. Um, certainly warships uh, were often uh, counterfact, which was meant, means that they were enclosed, um, uh, mainly to protect themselves from missile fire and arrows, and as a consequence that reduced the ventilation. It was very unpleasant being a sailor on one of these ships. Uh, in battle, let alone uh, with the threat of death and destruction, let alone doing the cruises to the islands. Um, getting back to the quadrivines, uh, their major task was uh, with 360 um, rowers uh, and uh, marines of 140 or so, their task was to escort, transport and they formed the majority of the attack force uh, within the fleets of the, um, the Romans and the Carthaginians. The uh, quinquiremes uh, were their big brothers, not so much in length but wider in beam, um, 130 tonnes Again, length was about 50 odd metres. Same speed, about seven, to seven or eight knots. The rowers have substantially increased. There are up to 800 rowers in these ships. So you've got banks of these very long oars, and they've got multiple, uh, they've got three people on each oar um, on three decks. So they're fairly square um, shaped, uh, solid ships and they were able to mount war engines, carry a lot more troops, uh, which is why you've got marines of 1,000. And their job was to basically transport troops in safety uh, for invasions, offloading them uh, at ports, and also to capturing the larger ships of uh, the enemy. They generally were uh, the flagships, transports are used in the attack. Weapons and tactics. This is a common one that most people know about, is ramming. We'll talk about that. Boarding, and that's ore destruction, missiles, and the war machines. Uh, war machines were generally fitted on towers or on the decks of, uh, of ships, and we'll just very briefly talk about those. Um. Okay, the rams, or the rostrum, uh, they were generally made of bronze, and uh, they were about 90 to 120 centimetres long. Uh, we know this from examples that have been recovered. Um, the weight was about 80 to 120 kilos of bronze that was cast. Uh, the largest that's been recovered was uh, one off uh, the coast of Israel, was 600 kilos. 600 kilos. So um, that's the size of several, small, uh, several large fridges in weight uh, perched on the, on the bow of these, um, these, uh, the ships. Um, they often had wings, and I'll show you an example of what I mean by wings. Um, and the general task was to obviously punch holes below the water line um, and split the holes of the, um, of the opposing ships so that uh, water would come in and then they would, the ships would uh, fill, generally in 6 to 30 minutes. It was very hard to sink these ships. Why? Because they were made of wood, and wood floats. Um, and these are slight wood. Um, oh, there's a Monty Python script about a witch about that, but um, the, uh, the ships were made of, as I said, fir, spruce, elm and pine, and so were fairly light. But what would happen is that uh, once they were filled with water, um, they, the undulations of the waves would tend to break them up. Um, and they were very hard to, um, to recover. Uh, you have to tow them and beach them. And if they're full of, if you try to move a swim, a kid's swimming pool full of water, trying to move 110 tons of uh, water out of a ship would be somewhat a, a, of a challenge. The, um, the rams themselves, I'll show you a couple of pictures of them. That's one that's been um, um, recovered. And as you can see, there's, um, there's a, the trident motive, which was a fairly common, and we'll, at, have a look at this one. This is a, a copy of a, a marble ram in Ostia. Um, it's of, reportedly of exactly the size of a ram, so you can see by comparison of a, on the person. But those wings, the, the horizontal uh, elements, that's these pieces here. The aim of that and the, and the central uh, um, cutting device was to actually punch a hole and split uh, 
uh, the timbers, because as, uh, as you may remember, the, the mortise timbers were aligned one on top of the other, and although they had some framing to support them, their strength and their integrity was based on the mortise uh, alignment and uh, the, the strength of the timbers laterally. So as they were broken and cut, they would come into the centre of the into the ship, and, and even if they were tended to bounce back, they would be severed and tonnes of water would come in very, very quickly. Uh, I can only imagine the terror of sitting there rowing, because it would be a bit of a surprise to have one of these rams suddenly punch a hole, and if you are, if you are uninjured and you know, surviving the shock, you could then perhaps try and swim out, etc., um, and get away, but of course um, that would be somewhat problematic. Uh, a ship, as I said, could fill very, very quickly, within six minutes, so it didn't leave you a long time. And as you'll see by some of the crewmen, uh, they were not, they were fairly um, scantily clad, um, for mainly for comfort, but also, um, uh, I suspect, to, so that they could get out and move around in, within the ship very, very quickly. Um, and the whole point of, as I said, is once you've immobilised the ship, it couldn't do any damage to, them, to you, so that then you would normally withdraw and uh, uh, then go after another ship, etc. Uh, a couple of other examples, and in this case you can see how the sheath was the, um, it was formed over the, uh, the, uh, the bow of the, uh, or the prow of the, uh, the warship, and it protected the wood. And again you can see the, the, um, uh, the fins that actually spread the damage. This was found to be more effective rather than just a single cutting one, because a cutting one would only split the wood there rather than a whole block uh, of, and several multiple planks. Uh, this is the Olympias, which is a, um, um, a, a contemporary uh, reproduction by the Greek uh, Navy, uh, or the, by a group of uh, enthusiasts. It actually was publicly funded, and then uh, this ship served in the Greek Navy for a, a, a short time. Uh, it was primarily built to assess what a trireme could do in uh, ancient naval ships. Um, the main interest here is that you can see how uh, the ram was fitted quite comfortably to the, the prow of the ship and uh, just below the waterline, and it was fitted with these uh, brass uh, nails. Uh, and an example of how it sits on the water. This is uh, a little higher than normal, mainly because I suspect that the crew's not on board. On board. Uh, this was a bit of an art. To get a design and build a ship took uh, um, uh, a degree of skill uh, that was uh, achieved over you know, hundreds and thousands of years, frankly. Um, they were to, to build a ship that would sit at the right height in the water, because you didn't want to add extra ballast, because if you put ballast in it to lower it below the water, um, it would then be a lot heavier and harder to row and uh, to move. Um, apart from ramming, um, and in fact they used the ram as well, but the, the other way to destroy the mobility of a ship, because once a ship was isolated and immobile, um, it was pretty much useless and vulnerable to uh, other attacks, was to destroy the oars. Uh, this was normally done by the ships actually manoeuvring adjacent and running either from the forward position to the stern or from the stern back, uh, destroying the oars of, the, um, of your opponent's um, ships. Uh, as you can imagine, that would co create horrific damage to um, not only the, uh, uh, the oars, but to the men uh, that were actually manning them. If you can imagine holding an oar and have 110 tonnes of ship come along and hit the, hit the oar, at, at best it would rip it out of your hands uh, going forward and hit the, the next row of oars on the back of the head, um, and at worst it would do the opposite and hit you and uh, create a huge amount of uh, damage to the crew and injure the, the crew. Um, the ships did not have the capability of spare oars. They might have had one or two or three, but not enough to do a whole side. So once the oars were, were lost, um, the ship was in itself pretty much immobile. Obviously there was some ability to, if you lost on one side, to maybe pull some from the other side to get some mobility, but as a warship and as an effective warship, uh, you cease to be pretty much a threat to uh, your opponents. And if you were then immobile, you could not then avoid the subsequent ram that was likely to follow, and so the, not uncommonly, if this, was, this did happen, um, uh, ships would surrender to your opponents. Um, 
So all destruction required a, a, a fair degree of uh, seamanship to be able to, to manoeuvre ships, because obviously if the, the captain of your, um, the, the ship that's about to be uh, rammed would try and obviously avoid it, unless he was uh, too busy focused on trying to ram another ship. And uh, I can imagine the chaotic nature of where you've got some of the large battles where you've got hundreds of these ships manoeuvring uh, in between. While you're trying to ram one, someone's trying to ram you. Uh, another ship's moving close by and ripping and uh, destroying your oars. Um, then you've got a problem and then, uh, you know, then you become vulnerable. And this, this sort of chaotic nature would be uh, what was naval warfare of um, the, uh, the ancients in those days. It's an example, again, of the Olympus um, ports where they um, uh, had the uh, oars. Uh, often they had leather uh, shrouds so that obviously the water wouldn't um, t come in because water inside a ship is not very practical. Um, and it, it also allowed the, sh uh, the oarsmen to push the oars out uh, when they first manned or where necessary to withdraw the oars when they came in uh, to port or you know, in, a, in a case where they were uh, going into battle and, and wanted to withdraw the, port, the oars. I suspect it's a drill that they would have practiced um, quite uh, often because uh, it would be one way of saving those oars if they were threatened. Um, a common th feature of uh, the, these ships of this era were the towers and turrets. Um, there's an example of one on here. Um, that would give a significant height advantage to the, um, uh, the ships and they were often manned by archers and slingers. Um, they provided that height advantage so you could shoot and target the crew and the other marines on your opponents. They were often collapsible so that they could be assembled uh, actually on board the ship because during the sail, sailing and bad weather you wouldn't want that top heavy uh, element, uh, especially if you had multiple towers, um, because again that would make your ship unstable and in bad weather or inclement weather uh, you had the risk of capsizing. Um, and often, they certainly on the bigger ones, they were then uh, fitted with uh, war machines. Uh, like ballistas, etc., as in the example that we've got here. Uh, missiles were used by, um, by the crews, uh, including um, um, javelins and archers, and the main aim of those were to um, uh, injure the crew uh, where you could, certainly the other marines on your opponent's ship, and target the steering people and the captain and the other sailors on board the ship. The main aim was to try and immobilise it, especially if they could attack the, the people that were steering the ship. Uh, ballistas, uh, they could fire heavy, sh heavy bolts, uh, again to damage uh, the ship and the crew. Uh, they had an effective range of about 200 to, 200 to um, 300 metres. Uh, and some were later fitted with grappling hooks so that they could draw your opponent's ship together and then you could board them and, and attack them. There were also catapults. Uh, which fired spherical stone balls up to 27 kilos. So firing a catapult 200 metres um, uh, with a stone uh, uh, shot of about 27 kilos, it would make a mess of the deck and the ship if it hit you. And um, uh, obviously it could penetrate uh, the decking of, uh, of some of the lighter ships as well. However, the technology of trying to hit a, a moving ship with a moving ship on an un unstable um, uh, would be a bit of a challenge, and I'm not sure the, the physics and the fire or the gun control in those days. I think it was more of an opportunity uh, and a number of uh, catapults firing, and it was more by luck than intent. Having said that, if you had immobilised the ship, it was a lot easier target, and then you could stand off and actually then sink it. And that was when, you know, some of the times they'd actually fire fire pots into a stationary ship, ship uh, in order that they could... Um, uh, you know, sink, sink the ships. Examples of some ballistas. Um, but the main, main way that the Romans uh, and indeed less so the Carthaginians uh, captured and destroyed enemy ships was by boarding. It was sort of the land war bringing back to the naval war. Um, and that was by the use of legionaries uh, and marine, uh, marines, basically deck soldiers. So the main aim was to actually um, uh, marry up with a, an opponent's uh, ship, 
get on board and um, you know, kill the crew uh, after they've, you've killed their deck soldiers, etc. Some, sometimes there were not any deck soldiers or marines, and as a consequence, uh, you would then be able to uh, ruthlessly deal with uh, the crew, which would be um, pretty much unarmed. They would, be slight, they would be trained to some level to defend themselves, but uh, when, I, when, a, when 10, 20, 30 or 100 legionnaires jumped on a uh, uh, on board a ship, I suspect most of the crew uh, of the oarsmen and the sailors would be jumping overboard or getting out of there very quickly. Uh, there's a number of recorded instances where ships have been rammed and before they could withdraw, the marines would try and board uh, the, the opposing ship to capture it because once you've been rammed, you would then be uh, immobilised. So, so that you know, ramming a ship was not necessarily uh, guaranteed that you would sink it because some top for a brief period, you would be um, bound and tied together um, and it takes some time to, uh, to, to backwash and get out of there before uh, your opponents could deal with you as well because you certainly didn't want to get trapped with a, you know, having damaged or rammed one ship and be trapped in, uh, with that one as well. Uh, grappling hooks um, and the use of the corvus which we'll, we'll talk very briefly about. The corvus was an invention uh, by the Romans that was used during the Carthaginian War and in fact was the, uh, probably the determining factor of their naval supremacy in the sense of winning early naval battles. Uh, with the Corvus, which was a board, boarding gangplank, and I'll show, show you some pictures, but fundamentally it was about 11 metres long, 4 metres wide, and it, would, um, it was mounted on the, the forward end of the ship, and as it approached an enemy ship, it would then crash down, and the... Um, the beak, uh, the metal, big metal spike would embed itself in the top of the deck and then the troops would be trained to rush aboard, to kill the uh, enemy's uh, marines and capture the ship. Uh, and the Carthaginians in particular were very vulnerable to that because it was a bit of a surprise weapon. And once you're locked in, uh, it's very hard for you to then escape um, uh, from them. You actually have to physically lift uh, this corvus off, which uh, if you've got some um, 20 marines on there would be somewhat of a challenge. It weighed approximately one tonne, um, so you were you're pretty much uh, embedded and you had to fight that battle for survival. And that's how the Romans put a lot of troops on their uh, ships, uh, were able to uh, overtake and capture many, many Carthaginian ships. Uh, later on uh, in the war they used a grappling hook fired from a ballista, uh, in, order to, to, in order to again um, grapple a sh uh, ship, drag it to, to, together and then they could then board and fight um, uh, the, the battle. This is an example of a corvus. Um, I, want to I want you to hold this picture so that when we talk about later storms, etc., this is one ton of suspended. Uh, any uh, engineers and physics people uh, will tell you very quickly. Well, what one of the one of the biggest problems with this sort of uh, equipment is that it makes the ship extremely unstable, uh, especially in bad weather. In light weather like this, this is fine. But as you can see, it's quite extensive. It could reach out to a ship uh, and grab it and uh, then board and, and the, marines would, the marines and legionnaires would do the rest of the job. Uh, another example uh, here, um, pictorially represented, and the one in the far, this one here, as you can see, uh, the troops are now boarding in to, to uh, capture that uh, Carthaginian ship. Curing the ships. You recognise this one. Right. Um, a common misconception is that the crews were not slaves. Certainly in pirates and some of the smaller navies and some of the smaller nations, yes, they were slaves. Um, but to motivate men to get into this sort of sh ship uh, and uh, fight wars, uh, you needed men that were free and wanted to do that or had no choice. Uh, but they weren't slaves. And of course, you need them physically fit and well motivated because they had a they had a fairly substantial. They were the engine room of these warships. The oarsmen, and we'll just talk of those. And as you can see, I said scantily clad. Um, when, you can imagine in the Mediterranean, in the summer, in that enclosed environment, next to three other blokes, you 
doing all work um, and uh, the anticipation of, of battle all enclosed, um, you would want to be uh, drinking a lot of water, uh, going for swims and all sorts of things, I think, uh, to try and stay cool. And I think it beats the Jenny Craig weight loss program too. Uh, the varied in ship, as I said, somewhere between 50 to 1,000. Um, 120 was not uncommon, and as we've seen from some of the early examples. They were generally freedmen and soldiers, um, not slaves. And they're generally drawn from the lower ranks of Roman society, but they were often not Romans. Uh, the service was uh, 26 years. And on completion of the 26 years, uh, you were then given Roman citizenship. Um, just as, a, as an aside, like some of the legionaries, uh, legions, uh, often after a naval, substantial naval battle, if your ship or, or crew or squadron had done exemplary work, uh, you could gain a number of years advantage off your, your service, and in fact some of them uh, were made citizens straight after that, uh, maybe, maybe as a motivator for other, other ships and other crews as well. Um, training, it took skill and training to be an effective oarsman. If you can imagine 120 people trying to keep in time, and there were mechanisms to do that of course, uh, to keep in time uh, in a variety of battle envir environments, in a variety of sea states, uh, you, you've got to take your hats off to um, these guys that were able to do that. I've been involved in my very, very younger days in uh, crewing a, uh, a, a uh, a rowing skull um, on, for the head of the river at uh, one, one stage and just trying to get young men to actually coordinate was difficult, let alone 120 and 240 on both sides of the ship, all, all in time, etc. So, um, but they've been doing it for, for centuries, so they had obviously developed techniques and uh, uh, ability to do that. Other crews, the very, um, they had a, a captain obviously in charge of the ship, uh, the sailors uh, involved uh, were somewhere, uh, sailors generally between 20 to 50, uh, and they were responsible for looking after the ship, the ship maintenance, running the sails, the anchors, and, and doing um, all of that ship, um, good ship stuff to keep the, the ship effective. Uh, the drummers, the pausoirs, um, they would tap out a beat. Uh, the Greeks in their early times used um, the pipes, they were much more musically inclined. Uh, the Romans, being a little more military, um, used a drummer, and uh, that would tap out of uh, tap out of uh, tap out the beat, um, and it was rhythmic uh, as it had to be. Um, and there was a number of recorded songs. Um, um, in fact, one recently released uh, where they would actually sing a song to uh, help maintain the rhythm and the beat and also help relieve some of the boredom, I suspect, uh, as, as well. And obviously the drum would increase to, uh, uh, to, to achieve battle speed. There were two rudders um, steering oars on either side of the ship and apparently from all accounts a well-balanced ship it was relatively easy to, to steer by just single men uh, with the, the rudders. And there was a small uh, administrative staff uh, not necessarily on board the ship, but often at the home port to look after the administration of the ship, you know, purchasing stores, repairs, uh, looking pay and all that sort of thing as well. Right, oarsmen, as you can see by that picture, and this is where this concept of fours and fives, if you took a lateral slice off a ship, you have a, um, uh, a cross-section of the crew within each of those all brackets and uh, that's where the three, fours and fives. It's relatively self-explanatory so when you're reading your text and your history when you hear about a four or a five you'll see um, how that's actually determined and that'll give you some idea of the size of the ship. So here we have a, a trireme, typical um, uh, like the Olympus and, and what you will see on some of the early ancient movies. Um, that's the simplest configuration. You've got three vertical oars and three single men uh, powering that. So you've got basically, I suppose, six manpower of oar in there. The quadrine has got four. And there's a couple of ways of you know, stacking that. You can obviously have two men per oar, uh, but only have two oars. Uh, and in this case, you've got three oars, 
uh, each with um, the top deck being a lot, lot slightly wider, an ability to have two men in that space. Because the whole aim is to get more, or, or I was going to say horsepower, all power uh, within a section of, uh, of, a, of a ship. Uh, obviously, if you've got too much ship and l l less all power, it's not going to go as fast as a, 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 a good compact ship. And you, you're trying to get it as narrow as possible to reduce the drag and increase um, uh, the speed of the ship. Um, so this one here, you could have four men, um, which would be somewhat comfortable. Um, but there's a, there's a function of physics here, which is um, a bit of an issue. If you are standing here, if the sea is there and I'm the, the closest and I happen to be a short oarsman, uh, my reach is this and I grab my oar and I pull and I can engage a certain amount of uh, uh, water in, in that, that method. If I'm on this floor, I would need incredibly long arms, or to be the bigger, taller man, to actually apply um, the same sort of print because the arc of the oar would prescribe the longer, the further it is, it would have to go farther. So despite it appears to be a better physics and you know, an output, you know, a greater having four men on a single oar, the physics, the physics don't, don't support that because of the, the biological metrics, yeah. Can I ask a question just at this stage? Sure. Looking at those diagrams, if you're trying to run alongside to damage the oars, yep. how do you ship your own oars? Ah, that's what I said. Because if they're longer than the width of the ship. Ah, so what you, you actually slip them to the back or forward depending upon your positioning and in fact some of the ship designs had inclined benches because that helped um, with the, the physics of um, lining up the ship so obviously there's no point in you cleaning up everyone's oars if you yourself lose all your oars uh, so that was uh, that drill that I was just, just it would be natural for uh, them to have a drill where they would ship their oars and then the uh, uh, the helm would then merge the, the port of starboard and you know, skiff off against the other ship. And then you'd have to, it's, that's the seamanship and the skill that was involved, uh, so you'd have to do that very, very quickly. Because I suspect if you didn't do it quick enough, you'd, be, you'd, you'd know about it very quickly. Um, and um, I guess you don't have to do it really close to the ship as well. You can do it fairly um, you know, outside it as well, and that would you know, create that bit of room for as well. But if they were as efficient and saw that coming, they could perhaps slip their uh, oars as well. But in that chaos that's happening, if this, this, this side is slipping its oars, then the other sides are still oaring, you know, uh, you know, then the ship, the ship moves to the right. As I said, I, I can just imagine this whole complex of you know, 100, 200 ships merging in sea in open water, um, and, and it would just be chaos. I'd not like to have been there, I think. except on the winning side, I suppose. Yeah. And the Queen Queer of Reims, uh, which has got five, which seems to be a fairly common um, size and seems to be the well-balanced um, uh, result of you know, that progression of bigger and larger warships. And they've got two, two and one. So, when you hear about fours and fives in your reading, that's what that means. Four and five, just imagine those four or five oarsmen. Deck soldiers, marines, standard, standard legionnaire. Oh, by the way, how many people could, can swim? Put up your hands. I've got to say, thank you, that's good to see. I didn't want to embarrass someone that anyone can. You've probably had no need. Uh, you don't like the sea or the water. Uh, deck soldiers and sailors, uh, most of them could not swim. Not, could not swim. In fact, my recollection is until 1966, both the Royal Navy and the Royal Australian Navy, you didn't have to swim to be in the Navy. I have a problem with that, but, you know. <laughs> I would have thought the first thing I would do is going on joining the Navy is learn how to swim. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm a Leo, I'm optimistic, so I, I know my ship's not going to sink, but I'd, I'd, I would like to know. To, so. The, the problem with all of that is, of course, naturally, um, uh, the casualties for ships that were sunk uh, were fairly high. Uh, it was worse, because if you remember the oarsmen, what were they wearing? A loincloth and a cushion, not much else. Uh, they, if they could swim, they could get out. These guys, the legionnaires, they're wearing 45 kilos of body armour, etc. So if they're, they're involved in, if they go in the water, they're going very, very quickly down. I don't think the quick release straps um, were quite invented there, or Velcro. I think they were tied leather, etc. So uh, please share, just think about that again, that panic, and uh, if your ship is going over, you fall overboard. <laughs> 
Uh, you'd want to win the battle, wouldn't you? Um, generally equipped with uh, shield and uh, gladius and javelins, pretty much standard. Uh, and there were also archers and uh, uh, slingers em employed on the ships. Organisation, just very quickly, operated in squadrons of 10 ships. Um, the commanders were drawn from the equestrian uh, class. Um, there's some debate as whether the squadrons were more, but from what um, I have read in a number of other, other scholars, generally they operated in squadrons of 10. Uh, fleets were commanded by a prefect, uh, sometimes a consul. Um, they were um, normally established for specific missions and orient, uh, uh, so they were grouped together and drawn together by command and were given a specific task, etc. Um, and they op generally operated out of fixed and defended ports. Uh, they were rarely um, roaming the oceans looking for trouble, etc. Uh, they operated out of ports. Um, they were there for a specific mission, uh, and even battles uh, that you will uh, uh, read about, etc. They were generally uh, ships were in port, and other ships were said to be besieging them. What they would actually do is not necessarily sit outside uh, the port waiting for them to come out, but have enough reaction time. They would beach in nearby ports or uh, on the shore and suddenly uh, once the other ships were trying to get in or get out uh, they would uh, mount their ships and then sail out to meet them. Uh, again as I said service was 26 years. Um, and Recognition, uh, the Navy is uh, the senior service in military circles um, and certainly in the early times uh, the Navy was subservient to the Army. I can remember that to some of my Navy colleagues. Um, the archaeological red record, how do we know all of this about the ships? How do we know all of about, about uh, you know, the equipment and the size of the ships, etc.? Um, the archaeological red record gives us some idea. Um, there's I'll, give you some, I'll show you some pictures, so just bear with me. Um, there's depictions of battles. For example, on the uh, Arch at Orange in France, um, the sculpture showing rams uh, and the, the, the uh, bowels of ships. Um, uh, the sculptures of, of soldiers and marines on board ships uh, engraved into, in some of the reliefs. Um, reliefs like Trajan's Column, um, which tell the story, and, and in fact not only warships but transports, uh, etc., give us a lot of information about the size, not necessarily the proportion, because as you'll see in one of the pictures, uh, the artists, as they often do, uh, take a little bit of a license. Uh, texts and coins, there's an, uh, a quite a large uh, pneumatic uh, uh, support of ships, uh, not only of their size, but they were released to uh, um, commemorate uh, important naval events. Um, and so they, they're emblazoned with not only uh, naval um, um, ships, but also um, names of battles and things. And obviously a lot of texts themselves have um, passing comments about uh, navies, numbers of ships and that sort of thing. Depictions of Roman ships with rams from the temples of Isis and, and others, and we'll have a quick look at those. Uh, sockets of the Actium uh, Monument. Uh, the Actium mo Monument, uh, probably one of the major naval battles uh, uh, in Roman uh, history, uh, the number of um, rams that were collected were fitted to a monument, but the, the ram's socket, sockets uh, were carved out of stone and the rams were then uh, placed on them and basically slid like the prows of ships to make a, a big uh, 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 a memorial to the, to the event. Um, although the rams have gone because they were bronze and you know, um, collectible and important metal, um, the sockets are there as well, so that gives us a good size and there's some significantly large uh, sockets there, so that gives us some idea again of proportionality and extending. Obviously, if you've got something at 60 kilos and this one's estimated at 110, it's logical that the ship needs to be bigger to support it and wider, etc. And recovered rams, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and excavated ancient ports. There's a number of ports of antiquity that have now been excavated, um, including some ships, um, but uh, the ports themselves have been excavated and the, the bays um, and the wharves where the ships 
uh, was secured uh, have been, you can measure them out and that gives you a clear idea of what size a lot of the ships were, both in Carthage and Greece and a number of other places. Um, that, that's fairly important for us because, uh, again, by the time you've excavated them, it'll give you a, a, a fair idea of um, the actual size because obviously um, that's where they were generally stored, especially during the winter months. Uh, just looking at some of this um, this record, as you can see here, there's a, um, a Roman um, a, um, warship here. It's, it's got a prow, um, some idea, and as I said, the license which uh, uh, is taken with the size of the uh, uh, the crew and the the legions legionnaires. Uh, that's mainly so that you can see them in their equipment. That tells us a lot about the, the shape itself. This lattice work uh, would tend to indicate that it's not a warship on battle duty where it's not being uh, enclosed. Uh, the lattice work was actually very important because it opened up the um, uh, the ship to allow breeze through, which was pretty important, especially on those long trips. Uh, this is uh, some examples of the relief of orange and you can clearly see the structure of the rams and the prows of the, the warships and um, it gives you again information on, on how the, you know, quite a bit of detail about the shipping. Isis Temple of Pompeii, um, again very clear uh, if not somewhat stylized of the troops on board um, and two sets of um, uh, oars and that so it's probably a quadrine because of the width of it and a few more. And again, these are actually in bays, um, and, but quite clearly you can see the bronze uh, rams and again the structure of the ships as well. Funerary reliefs were fairly common. Um, uh, sarcophagi, etc. were fit, uh, especially for senior naval officers, etc. often had these um, uh, carved into them and you can see in this case the tower there uh, the marines on top um, and as you see by the model uh, they're pretty well exposed so pose a question there's no accommodation first second or third class on these ships so this is now a troop ship taking you from Rome to Alexandria to, so that you can fight in Egypt where are you sitting on the deck so you ended up, I suspect you're not wearing your armour and all your gear, but you're on your deck uh, sitting down and stretching your legs and, and making your way all the way to uh, Alexandria. So life as a deck soldier was, I think, probably relatively unpleasant. Um, and, and when you look at all, you know, 120 or 240 oarsmen inside doing their work, they've got to take respite. I don't think the ablutions or the toiletry uh, uh, were probably very generous. I think the stern of the ship was probably very busy for a little while. Um, the record of, you know, they certainly got uh, con uh, containers of water, barrels of water and wine were very common uh, and certainly some of the sunken ships we've recovered, were, you know, or where the ships have been, uh, have been, uh, you know, had uh, bags of nuts and other food and that sort of thing. So, uh, but I think it was fairly, I think they would have been delighted to get to port. Uh, a lot of the historical journeys, uh, when the, you recount and look at uh, some of the texts, um, were often day trips. They would, what I mean by day trips is they would sail from port to port to port. So the evenings were spent uh, uh, getting a meal, resting, etc. Because there was just functionally uh, no ability to do that on board. And this lasted for three, four hundred years. Um, recently, 2008, uh, in one of the battles that we'll just discuss after uh, afternoon tea, um, a number of rams have been recovered. Uh, have, do we have any dentists here? Okay, that's good. Um, one Italian dentist apparently had purchased somewhat illegally um, one of these rams and had had it outside his surgery. Uh, the Antiquities Police, um, uh, I think it was about 2002 or you know a little bit earlier, um, obviously arrested him initially, I suspect, after some money um, they were released, um, and he paid a sum to Antiquities and the, uh, the, uh, the ram was recovered. Um, what was important, though, was that out of that, where the location was found, uh, because apparently it had come from some fishermen, because that's often what was left of these uh, the ships, uh, so far 11 rams have been recovered, all in varying conditions, so, um, which is really good for the, uh, the shipologists, if that's a word. And uh, again, Roman sculpture uh, reflects the rams as well. 
Uh, this is um, the Olympus if you're ever in Greece on your next Grecian holiday. Um, pop into Piraeus and have a look at this uh, trireme and you'll get some feel for the, uh, the ship. It's now um, uh, per as a permanent exhibit because frankly it was too expensive for um, Greece to maintain. Um, a ship like this would last somewhere between 20 or 30 years in, in combat. Uh, I think the only oldest record uh, is about 120 years a ship would last, mainly because it's made of soft wood and you know, so prone to the elements and uh, damage. And um, yes, um, just one thing I didn't mention was uh, with sail, um, a ship would sail about four to six uh, uh, kilometres, um, sorry, four to six knots uh, with sail up with a fa favourable wind. Do we have any questions? Yep. Um, yes, and in the, in the back of the ship, uh, they were actually oars. So the vertical orders, pl oars placed, and a well-balanced ship, a single man could stern it, and they would obviously do it in unison, um, and there's one normally either side. The lighter Liburners only had a single uh, oar on the, the steering system. Ah. <coughs> yes, what you don't want is to be oaring at eight knots and having the wind uh, blowing against you at eight knots, because um, that wouldn't work. But uh, normally um, in battle, um, uh, there, you wouldn't have your sails down uh, and you wouldn't go into battle because that would remove your flexibility and your, your manoeuvrability. It also remove a significant amount of top, top weight. And w certainly one of the battles, that was how Rome, Rome were able to outmaneuver the Carthaginians um, because simply they had uh, uh, removed all their, their sail gear, um, etc. because that would reduce their top weight. Yep. Uh, you mentioned the Carthaginians. Yep. Any significant differences in the structure of the boat? No, no. Very, very little difference. No, no. And in fact, most of the Roman navy was copied from uh, uh, Carthaginian ships. It was a fairly... And they owed their legacy and their heritage to uh, the Greek, Greek ships of 400 years ago, before that. Yes? No, no. Trans transport ships were what they... These warships are generally called the long boats. The transport ships were called the fat boats or the round boats, I think, literally. And they were designed to uh, a lot broader and they were generally had sails. Some had some oars, etc. Um, but they were generally um, just the... the um, no, they were, they were a lot broader in, in, and so, so that they could carry. Uh, and some of them quite uh, reasonable weights, etc. In fact, in, there's instances of those boats being, as war, transports with horses on, uh, being towed by um, the warships as their motive power. Yes? Yep. It certainly is. I'm sure there is, and, and a metallurgist, uh, a study of those techniques would certainly be able to tell you, um, but they were generally c uh, cast. In fact, one of those new rams that have just been recovered has actually got the fingerprint of the guy that made it. <laughs> so it's, I think they used the lost wax method or something because apparently uh, there's clearly a, th uh, a fingerprint of this guy and it's there. So thousands of years ago, he's left his mark. <laughs> yeah. Yes? A wood and metal, yeah. So iron was fairly common. So, as I said, that's why it was weighed one ton, and it was on a post with pulleys, and you could swing it around and then just, yeah, just crash to the. If you missed, you'd have to haul it back up, of course. I guess. So, um, but yeah, it was quite a surprise. Yes. Is there archaeology still going on around here? Oh, all the time. All the time, yes, yeah. Um, most of the naval barrels and the ships were made of, as I said, light wood. So the, the only things you do recover now is, uh, like at the Battle of Actium sites, um, rams and the the shot from uh, the catapults, yeah, and brass nails, bronze nails as well. Lots. Of, yeah. Yes. Okay, the Carthaginian, 
And I'll cover that in a second, but very quickly. The Carthaginian is a superior seaman, contempt for the Roman, I'm going to come to you. And that's, that's how the... Come to me and, oh, what's this thing? Oh, stupid Romans, clunk. Oh, now I'm in trouble. <laughs> so, yeah. I think if there are any more questions, we might hold them until um, tea time, which is now. Can we just thank Mike for a wonderful presentation? Thank you very much. Thank you. Go on. And uh, we'll regroup here in...